So good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to those that have just started to join us. We've got a few of you coming here today, so uh, we'll just hold on and wait for, for the rest of the, those that are expecting to come along today. It's a, it's a very sunny day here in uh, in my part of Sweden, and spring is definitely in bloom. So I think that's bringing in some um, hopeful, hopefully some respite for uh, ease of uh, energy heating demands. So hopefully that's uh, the start of warmer times to come. Hopefully you should all be muted, so please make sure that you are. Um, and um, if anyone has any questions, I will we'll just remind everyone a bit later on, but we'll please aim them towards the Q&A. We've got three great speakers for you today, um, from uh, all, all commenting on our, our talk today of energy security for cities, thinking about the, the costs and the energy security issues and what we can all do to, uh, to try and address those. <clears throat> some more people coming in. Excuse me, I've got a bit of a husky voice this morning. It must be all the chocolate Easter eggs that I've been eating. So as I said, we have uh, we have three great speakers. We will take questions via the Q and A as we run along through this morning. Um, please uh, please share all questions, any thoughts, any things that come to mind. We we are hoping to. Have some great discussions. We've intentionally asked the speakers to keep their presentations a little bit shorter this morning to encourage that um, and give us time to have those discussions and field some questions. Some more people coming in this morning. Before we get into the session, I'd like to take the opportunity to pay respects to the people of Ukraine. This is um, a very strange situation in which um, some terrible things are being undertaken in the world. And um, I don't, you know, I'm not experienced enough in geopolitical issues to get into that, into the details of it in, in, uh, in the complexity. But, um, you know, I, it's definitely clear to me that our desire for cheap energy and energy at sort of any cost has now been brought to the forefront. So whether that's Russian oil or Middle Eastern or North Sea oil and gas, um, or even Canadian shale gas. You know, we need to think about where we're getting our oil from and uh, our energy from, and and how we can we can reduce and manage that energy consumption. I was really surprised and really happy to see the uh, the comments from the German economics minister, Mr. Harbeck, and he was talking about how every German could uh, reduce the amount of fuel used or energy consumption or turn down the thermostats and how that was helping to address these issues that we're facing now. Um, and I think that um, as, a, as a former energy manager or someone working on energy efficiency, I really feel like that's something we need to, to progress and work with. So um, just a few more people coming in. So for those of you who might be involved in the Celsius Forerunner groups, I also wanted to remind you that we have a follow-on session planned where you can pose some more questions, we can have a more open discussion. Um, and if you, if you didn't get the, the link or the email and the invitation, and please drop your details into the chat and we can make sure we share that for you. Um, and if you're also interested in continued discussion, then please, yeah, drop your email into the into the chat and we can we can make sure you get the invite for that session. So just coming up to five minutes past. I think that's probably enough chat from me. I'll um what I'll do is hand over to each of the speakers in turn, um, and then we'll then have this roundtable discussion afterwards. We also have two further experts with us today, um, Lars Larsen and uh, Christina Lindgren from uh, IVL, who will also be helping to, to challenge our speakers and, um, and get some more details from them on, on their interesting topics. Our first presentation today is from Odd Gigamundsen, um, who uh, has a PhD in engineering and has been with Danfoss for 10 years. His focus is on the future development of district energy sector and his role in an integrated smart energy system. Um, he's done many um, talks for Celsius and been involved with Celsius and um, 
personally is one of my favorite talks to the Celsius Forerunner Group so far. Uh, but recently he'd written to the Celsius Initiative on the competitiveness costs of district heating in Denmark. And that's what he'll be presenting to us today. Um, so welcome, Odgir. Nice to see you. Thank you. I'll just introduce the, the further two speakers. Um, so Dmitry Romanchenko, who'll be next after Odgir. He holds a degree in energy systems modeling analysis and is an expert in energy systems modeling. Um, he's a member of the energy group at IVL, the Swedish Environment Institute, and he'll present today on his work developing a tool to assess the levelized cost of heating. And then uh, our last speaker, um, but not least, that's for sure. Good morning, Anna. Um, she's morning. a senior researcher at the uh, research group in Tallinn University, um, and she'll be also presenting on some, some work that she's written for the Celsius Initiative, and that's about the progress being made in Estonia to move away from gas-fired heating and towards um, wood-fired or biomass-fired uh, heating systems. So with no further hesitation, I will, um, I'll hand over to Odgir. Um, please uh, take the floor or the digital stage and um, over to you. Thank you. So I will share my presentation now and please confirm that you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Yeah, so I was asked to talk about the district heating competitiveness and add a little bit of flavor to it, the resilience. Now, the basis of what I'm talking about is shown uh, in the, is actually this analysis that we made a couple of years ago, where we compared district heating to individual heating technologies in Denmark. And when we go, Hopefully I can change the, so I seem to have some problems, no? It's okay. Yeah, that's good. So first of all, we need to realize a little bit what we are comparing and I know the group here, which is attending has some knowledge of it, but this is about the building and the heat losses that we need to compensate. And when we are doing that, we must have a, clear system boundaries where we are considering what kind of a cost are involved and so on. And there are other parameters as well. And that is the energy demand quality. So the quality of the energy that we need, and that is low. But when we want to have energy supply security, then we actually want to have a high, no wait. <laughs> so here, I'm, I have to rethink here. Here, I want to introduce to you the individual solutions where we have energy demand quality that we are fulfilling is low, but we are supplying with a high quality energy that is individual boilers or heat pumps or something like that. We have system complexity of this kind of a system. It's relatively low. As a building owner, we have a heat generation unit and we know it's rather simple. We just plug it in and it heats our house. But the cost effectiveness of that unit is relatively high. So we don't have a good cost effectiveness, it's a low level. The reliability of such individual solutions is high. Usually it works and simple to fix if something goes on, but it's not particularly resilient. So if something breaks, you may have to wait for a couple of days, or if the supply to you, the natural gas or the electricity breaks, you're simply stuck. You cannot do anything. And when it comes to the synergy with the rest of the energy system, this kind of a individual thinking gives rather low synergy potentials. There's not much that you as an individual can do to play with a bigger system. Another issue that is many times neglected here is that we see energy coming into the house and then we say that, that is the energy that we're using, but we might be missing out to count for the conversion, conversion losses in the power plants or the mining losses of natural gas. Another approach for heating is the district heating. There we are still supplying low quality energy. And, but now we are adapting the supply 
quality, energy supply quality. So we're supplying low quality energy for low quality demand, and this is important. In this system boundary, we obviously have more complexity. So it's a high complexity system, but it is also very high cost effectiveness. The reliability of such a solutions like district heating is exceptionally high. So if your substation breaks, usually it's no, no problem to just fixate the valve so that you have a steady, steady supply. If some heat plant breaks, it doesn't matter because usually you have built in spare capacity. The resilience potential of this is also very high that if you see the natural gas now going through the roof, you can usually just have different heat supply to the system. When it comes to the energy potential, it's also very high because you can turn on and off a heat plant to fulfill the expectation from the wider energy system where you can take waste heat from where you have waste heat. But an issue when it comes to the infrastructure system is like what happens when the demand is changing and now the existing building stocks are changing. We are getting new windows, new doors and all kind of increased efficiency going from G rating to A rating. How will that impact? Also, when we have new buildings, they are built to high standards. It's generally just A grade buildings. Now, if you take that into account and we start to plot in what the cost of heat from either district heating, as is shown here, or comparable decarbonized solution, individual solution, here I have picked out air to water heat pump, then the ability of the district heating system to scale down the cost is quite effective. So we go from a normal building to a very low energy or passive house building. We don't we don't see a big change in the cost of heat per megawatt hour. But if we look on the individual solutions, then the problem is that we have fixed cost, the fixed cost of the unit, and that doesn't vary so much, even though you have a low energy building. So the cost per megawatt hour of heat is getting quite high when you insulate the building or getting more efficient. Now, I did not only look on, or we did not only look on air to water heat pumps, we also looked on oil boilers, wood pellet boilers, natural gas boiler, el pure electrical heating, and then the heat pumps, either air to water or ground source. And here we have a rather high energy consuming building, and we can see the, how the cost of the district heating splits. You can see that in the report if you have interest in that. And then how it is for the individual solutions. Here it's very clear district heating is more economical, and this is the total cost per year. And if you look on a low energy building, so it's consuming in the analysis five megawatt hours of heat, you can also see that the cost of district heating is actually scaled down and it remains cost competitive. Now, just to reflect shortly on the increase in the energy prices, here's a graph from Denmark where we have the district heating as the yellow one, the green is the natural gas, and finally blue is electricity. And here we see that there has been a great increase in the natural gas and electricity, while well, district heating in Denmark has actually been stable or even getting cheaper. So this is the power of district heating. Now I leave the floor to you, Oliver, again. Thanks very much, Odge. That's, uh, that's very interesting. It's amazing to see these numbers um, put out in such an, a concise way. And um, hopefully we can get into those in a bit more detail. So thanks, Odge. We'll talk some more. Over to you, uh, Dimitro. It's, uh, the floor is yours. And I unmute myself. I hope you can all hear me now. We can, and we can see your slides. Uh, excellent. So hello, everyone. I am pleased to present today during this webinar. Uh, thanks to everyone who has joined and for the introduction, Oliver. Uh, yes, uh, my presentation will slightly resemble what Odge just showed, which is very nice because some of the results will actually look quite similar. So let's see if our conclusions really match. 
Uh, so my name is Dmitro, and I will present in from on behalf of the uh, IVL, which is a Swedish Environmental Institute. And uh, without a uh, long introduction, let's jump in. As many of you know that uh, heating and domestic hot water already constitute a huge share of their energy demand in buildings. In as Eurostat points out, is that 75% of all the heating and cooling is based, unfortunately, on fossil fuels in Europe. And that issue, as we already see, as we already saw before, but quite pressingly see nowadays, is a huge obstacle to the energy security and supply in Europe. Uh, this meaning that if you have such a problem of high energy demands, we have as a society two uh, conceptual objectives. One is to reduce the energy consumption as a total number. Another objective is to reduce dependence on fossil fuels. And as we know now, especially in the case, for example, of Germany, we should reduce the dependence on natural gas. If you convert these two objectives to a question or one of the questions, so it should sound something like, which heating alternative to choose and invest in. And as we see on the picture to the right, the number of heating uh, technologies is exceedingly high. So at least 20 here, I would say. So if you look here and then we try to reflect on this question, uh, we can also identify two main perspectives from which we can address this question. So one would be called as Oh, we usually call it, uh, people who work with, for example, energy modeling, we call it a social planner perspective. That means we will need to identify the optimum heating technology from the societal point of view. Another point of view is the point of view of a house owner, so as a private consumer. And in this specific representation, I will address the second view. So how do we choose the heating alternative as individuals? So for the purpose of, of a project that is called Reuse Heat, we have tried to develop an Excel-based tool. Uh, we call it just a tool or it's an LCOH calculation tool. Uh, what it does, so the tool calculates the so-called levelized cost of heat. That's already the concept that Odgir introduced before me, but let me get a little bit more into details on how it works. So the levelized cost represents how what is the cost of heating for a house owner, for example. And this type of tool can provide us with the possibility to compare costs of heating from various heating alternatives. And as I already pointed out before, but I want to stress it again, we only take the household owner perspective while applying this tool. Uh, the main concept about this tool is that it is based on Excel, so it's fairly simple, it's an open source. Uh, this also implies that the tool can be adjusted or adapted to a specific country, to a specific case, to a specific technology. For example, in our tool, we have considered pretty much the same technologies as Odgir already presented, and I'm not sure if I can move my own screen here. So, for example, on this screen to the right, you see some examples, for example, a gas boiler or as a biomass boiler. And in this calculation tool, we have a number of parameters that we describe these technologies with. So some of these te some of these parameters are technical, for example, a total efficiency assumption or the emission factor assumption. But most of the parameters are economic. For example, we take into account what is the normal price or the average price of a, of a unit if a person wants to invest in it. So let's say a biomass boiler can cost around 10,000 euros, a gas-fired boiler can cost around 6,500 euros. And we see a number of other parameters that can be extracted from the tool or can be added to the tool to make a valid calculation. What we see as a result of the tool is a so-called LCOH, which is a levelized cost of heating for each of the studied technologies. But you can also see the breakdown of this number. So how large is the share of a capital cost in this number? How large is the share of the fuel cost? How large is the share of taxes and levies and everything else? And you can access this tool by going through the reuse heat uh, 
web page, we will, I guess we will be able to provide the link to that after the webinar. So after that, we can show, I can show you a, a result that is sim that looks quite similar to what was shown before. As this, this is a result of the tool and it is show it shows your results for Germany. So what we can see here first is on the uh, X axis, we see a number of technologies. Again, this are quite the same as we, we showed you before. It's a gas boiler, it's a biomass boiler, oil boiler, a number of heating pumps, and then two types of district heating. One we call high temperature district heating and one is low temperature district heating. What you can also see is a breakdown of this levelized cost of heat into these five categories, which is the capital, fuel, operation and maintenance, taxes and levies and environmental cost, which is the cost of CO2. And looking at that picture for specifically for Germany, I wanted to provide you with a couple of conclusions, I guess. And the first one would be that the price of district heating, even without or even before we go into low temperature district heating, we can see that the cost of heating for a house owner is approximately the same as the cost of a gas boiler or the oil boiler. Now, if you take into account the recent developments on the global market and on the, in the geopolitics, specifically, yes, yeah, this uh, war in the east of Europe, we can say that probably the gas boiler does not really hold its position as a long-term solution, specifically, let's say, for the German market. Even so, the capital cost can be cheaper as the cost of investment in district heating. But another conclusion is that if we develop and uh, provide a strong push to the development of low temperature district heating, which we believe can provide a lower cost for the final user, because, for example, in the low temperature district heating, we will have lower losses in the network, we will be able to use high shares of waste heat in the network, so the price of heating is likely to decrease for the final user. And then people can not only relax their dependency on one source of heat, they can also spare some money on enjoying some reliable and long-term solution as a low temperature district heating. And another small reflection is that heat pumps, as we also know, is a vital option for heating. It's probably a bit more economically sound for rural areas where building a district heating network is so much a logical choice. But for that, specifically in Germany, a number of factors should also go down as a capital cost or the taxes on electricity should go down for the heat pumps to become economically viable. And a number of conclusions for me would be is that uh, choosing a heating option is of course an increasingly complicated task given all the all the prices and taxes on the market and, and everything else. Uh, cost competitiveness, competitiveness depends on a number of assumptions because even in the tools that I have presented, we have a number of assumptions and constraints and simplifications. So hopefully we can get into discussion around that afterwards. But anyhow, when people that work with district heating or with, that work with heating in general, and after we have made some analysis, we can still conclude that district heating is an economically viable option. So if you choose to trust us, or if you want to double check us, please use the tool, please use other tools and check for yourself that district heating is indeed a better option, at least than gas. I guess that would be everything from me at the moment. I would be uh, glad to answer all of their questions in the discussion panel, but that's everything from me for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitro. It's really interesting. And I, I, um, I have loads of questions and thoughts about this, but I did see that one's come through from the Q and A and maybe you could respond to that while, uh, while the next presentation's going through. But um, yeah, and also to everyone, participating i think that question about the cost competitive and the assumptions and maybe there's some questions about your country where you're from uh, or some experiences that you could bring forward into our discussion so uh, i would uh, prompt you all to think about that because it would be interesting to explore this further especially with the speakers we have today so thank you Dimitro. hello anna are you out there yes you are nice to see you just ask Dimitro to stop sharing and then i'll um, pass the floor over to you
this uh, tricky period of uh, in between sessions. There we go. Perfect. Thanks very much. You're you're muted still though. Okay, a little bit changed situation when you start presenting. Uh, so good morning to all participants and I'm really glad to participate in this Celsius talk. And today's topic is very important and is widely discussed in Estonian society as well. Energy security and heat supply security and first wave of discussions has started in the end of 2021 due to extreme price increase for natural gas and electricity. Uh, but in this period, economical aspects were in the focus. But now there are more discussion regarding energy security, because one thing when fuel is too expensive and another when it is not available. So speaking about heat supply, it is important to mention that Estonia is a northern European country with heating season starting from September to May, and about 70% of heat supply is covered by district heating. And here you can see the map of Estonia, and these rose colors uh, color show district heating regions. And if you look on map with the Estonian municipality, you will see almost the same picture. Because in most places where multifamily buildings are located, district heating is available. One of the reasons is the strong support from the government, because based on district heating law, in the case of any new construction of, or even some serious renovation of building that is located within district heating region, the first priority should be district heating. And we have 230 district heating regions in Estonia. So if we look in energy balance in Estonia, 6% of energy is generated from natural gas. Uh, there are other fuels like local fuel, oil shale and shale oil products, and, uh, um, but the natural gas uh, mostly received from Russia. But there is almost no electricity generation from natural gas, some very small gas CHP. From the other side, for heat generation, natural gas use is still rather significant. You can see here that the share of natural gas is about uh, 20%. But what is important that uh, this amount, amount of natural gas uh, consumption for heat generation has decreased significantly before. There was massive gas and shale oil boiler replacement by wood chips boilers during last decades. And mostly it was due, possible due to support of government and European structural foundations. And there are plans and plans in energy plans of different municipalities to replace remaining gas boilers. And if we look on each uh, district heating network uh, in Estonia, there are only few of them that use natural gas uh, uh, boilers as base uh, for base load. It is very seldom when natural gas is used as backup fuel. Mostly uh, oil or shale oil is used for these purposes. Some districts have container gas boilers with the nearest plant to, repla uh, to replace it by wood chips. But why the share of natural gas is still rather high for district heating? So the main reason is using of natural gas as uh, fuel for peak boilers. And here you can see the example of Tallinn district heating network where the base load is covered by waste incineration plants and CHP working with wood chips but due to feeding premium support for which if, uh, CHPs, uh, uh, they can operate during all the year, rejecting, rejecting heat to atmosphere during summer. But at the moment, there is no heat storage facilities installed, installed there. And during winter time, three peak gas boilers are switched on, resulting around half of heat produced from natural gas if we take annual fuel consumption. But two weeks ago, it was decided by our government, and here you can see our Prime Minister Kaya Kallis, 
that Estonia will stop buying gas from Russia by the end of this year because of a terrible war in Ukraine. For sure, it is related uh, with difficulties for district heating operators because uh, district heating is one of the main gas uh, users. And Estonia consumes about five terawatt hour of gas per year. So uh, what solutions for district heating operated to, to provide uh, safely uh, heat to their consumers are available at the moment? For sure, very important uh, solution, but uh, it is long-term option. It is heat demand reduction. Already much has been done and the district heating network has have been renovated and energy uh, efficient building has been, um, building has been uh, re reconstructed and energy efficiency of building has been increased. But still, uh, it was not enough to avoid natural gas consumption in, in Estonia. So energy efficiency will have to be increased more and uh, due to low temperature district heating too. Another option that has not been implemented, but in the process of planning or construction are heat accumulated tanks coupled with the CHPs, wood, wood uh, cheap, base CHPs that will definitely decrease peak boiler operation time, especially during spring or and autumn period. And there are already planned tanks, uh, term, uh, thermal energy storage facilities in Tallinn and Tartu. One more option that is discussed and is considered as a backup option is shale oil. Shale oil is oil that is produced from local fossil fuel oil shale. Oil shale and shale oil consumption is related to really high amount of CO2 emissions, higher than for natural gas. Um, oil shale is used for electricity production and for shale oil production. Shale oil can be used on boiler houses to produce heat, and it has been used for a rather long period after Estonia became independent. And um, but during last decade, most of shale oil boilers have been replaced by biomass boilers, and in some cases by natural gas boilers. But in the large cities, there are options to switch gas boilers to shale oil. If so, technical and economical, it is possible solution, but for sure not preferable one and not sustainable solution from the point of view of climate aims in Estonia to become climate neutral country. Another option is the LNG storage facility. And government had decided that LNG storage facility in Paldiski on the north coast with a floating terminal will start to operate by the autumn 2022. In addition, in order to further mitigate the risk associated with seizing imports of Russian gas, it was another decision taken to acquire up to one terawatt hour of natural gas and these gas will be able to be sold to all market participants in the event of supply disruption. And this gas is planned to be stored in the neighboring Latvia in Inchokans reservoir. And in the end presentation, I just would like to mention uh, factors that are related to private consumers, to consumers. So private consumers of natural gas are the first priority. And they are, in the case of some problems, they will be the first priority for gas supply. District heating company are, are, is the last priority because they have another options. So they will be switched off from gas supply in the case of disruptions. But already from December, more new consumers located in the district heating regions start to connect to district heating. And if we compare the same period during previous year, added heating capacity of new consumers is two times higher. So stability of district heating uh, networks will, will increase. So this is all from my side. I hope it was interesting. Yes, it was really interesting. Thanks very much, Anna. It's, it's incredible to see the... Um... The, the approach that's been taken then is a very bold step um, and um, and also the the plans that are put in place to support that that bold decision so 
Um, I wonder if I could invite all of the other uh, presenters and, and speakers to join us to, to share their cameras today. Um, I've seen um, some comments coming through, but I, I wanted to ask one first question, and um, it was in relation to this sort of country comparison. So we have, we've talked about a Danish example, um, some, some figures from Germany and, and then Estonia, and I was wondering if, um, if anyone has any thoughts or perspectives on our experiences from other countries where um, you know some of these things could be discussed and uh, as another perspective. Yeah, I, I could say something about that. I think um, the situation we see when it comes to which kind, what kind of fuel you use, I, I will say that it's always um, a result of the current uh, tax system or other ways that the government want to support different areas. Uh, in Sweden, we've been very successful to reduce, uh, I would say, almost all fossil fuel in the district heating sector, but that's connected to the system we had in Sweden with uh, carbon taxes and things like that. So I, I think the situation is much based on uh, the tax system and the supporting systems. And, and that was one of the questions that came forwards for, for Dimitro with regards to the, the taxes in relation to the, the, the numbers presented there for, for, for Germany. Did, did you, um, as part of your project, did you manage to look at any other countries as as part of the, the tool as it was developed? Yes, in that project we also looked at France and Spain. And uh, basically the conclusion can be the same uh, from the two, is that district heating is a compatible option. Uh, I think only in Spain, uh, heat pumps also became a bit more competitive because, uh, no, in France, sorry, because there is uh, lower electricity prices and lower taxes on electricity. But otherwise, in all three countries here, we would say our observation is that district heating mainly competes with gas. Uh, but again, uh, a lot of, I mean, in the two is a simplification of reality, and we would really highlight that, that we encourage people to download it and try to play with taxes and numbers in your countries and adjust it to your country. Yeah, we'll share that, share that link. Go, go, Utke, sorry. Yeah, I just want to say that when we look on the duration curve from Tallinn, we can see something that is very important to take into account, that during the cold season, you have exceptionally high heat demand. And putting that on the electricity side, that is crazy. Even in France, where they are building nuclear power plants, it just shifts the problem from having lack of power in the cold season to having excess amount during the summer season. If they fulfill it with a nuclear power plant, for example. So those are typically not captured in the tax systems, but they definitely need to be thought through. Yeah, that is interesting. Christina. Okay. Oh, sorry. sorry. Ah, Christina. Okay. No, you can go first. It's okay, okay. Okay. I just would like yes to comment regarding uh, Estonian approach. So really you could, could see that uh, this support and uh, from government, just this obligatory district heating regions from the one side, it is very good, yes, for so district heating feels very stable and everything is fine, but Estonia has chosen the way for uh, wood burning, yes, so, uh, so the district heat is generated mostly from wood fine and uh, uh, that is why uh, it is extremely uh, hard to compete with some new technologies uh, with uh, large heat pumps and uh, low temperature district heating, solar heat, uh, what has been uh, used because uh, especially if we speak about uh, uh, large heat pumps, so if we took uh, uh, almost uh, climate neutral um, district heating, based on wood uh, firing and uh, heat pump, which, is, which are based on uh, electricity, which is produced from oil shale in Estonia. So, and if we compare CO2 emissions, in our case, this uh, transition would lead to CO2 emission increase. So, and we have one uh, component tariff. So any innovations uh, are very hard 
to implement in existing district heating. Okay, develop and uh, uh, very good covered Estonia, but but we have such situation. Just such. Amen. I, I was going to address the lock-in effect too in, in, in existing infrastructure. So what we have seen in the reuse heat project, as Dima said, uh, where we try to focus on how can you use more waste heat, well, then we see that we need this legislation, right? That it's not in place yet. What is waste heat? Is it comparable to renewable or not? It's not in any EU directive yet. And then also um, understanding that we are competing with incentivized investments in, for example, solar or whatever, which makes the payback on the low temperature or waste heat recovery scheme um, very long. So I just wanted to say that there is also this stress, uh, the policy side, from my perspective. Yeah, and I think that's really interesting. I think that, uh, as Anna pointed out, and I know from my experience in the UK, it, with regards to the policy and regulations requiring connections to heat networks. Um, and I was wondering about any other examples of developments that you think that could support this, this transition um, in terms of you know, the, the policy requirements. You know, I think you illustrated maybe a potential waste heat there, Christina. Is it any other thoughts that we, of, uh, of what we should be looking for? I think it's um, uh, it's a need of changing the whole uh, supporting system. It, it's uh, all areas, it's taxes, it's supporting system, it's financial systems. So it's a lot of, of uh, things that needs to be done. One thing I think was very interesting in um, Dimitrios' uh, presentation is that if you look at the district heating network, I, I think if a district heating network where network should be a responsible one, then you need to not have all um, all the same uh, eggs in the same basket. So if you if you have uh, big heat pumps, you have wood chips, you have uh, waste from industry. Uh, the the responsible for the district heating company should be to mix that to lowest cost and lowest emissions. So I think that's the, the total idea about district heating. Because if you have district heating and you just have one, one fuel, then you have the same situation as if you have separate boilers, except for, for the investments cost. So I think it's, um, it, it's very interesting to see that picture that district heating should optimize all uh, fuels. Now it's a lot of hands, good. Yeah, that's good. Go on, go on to me, <laughs> Yes, I, that coincides with my intention to comment on the previous comment from Odgeir, actually, because that's a, uh, that's a very good point you made, is that in a lot of modeling and in a lot of projections, heat pumps become an, um, a major source of heating in a lot of uh, uh, scenarios, both as individual heating sources as also a main source of heat in district heating systems. But for that case, I do not dare to project anything, but I would say that it's very important that we keep using energy systems modeling. For that case, we can uh, analyze a lot of scenarios. And in many cases, when we study different profiles of electricity prices for the future, we see results that also show that not only heat pumps, but also certain types of CHP plants should enter the system. And then the CHP plants together with heat pumps can indeed have this an, a nice balance of heat generation while assisting electricity system at the same time. And if uh, they are managed in a smart and, uh, and controlled in a better way, that is probably a very better solution in order to assist the overall energy system, but also to provide resi resilience and to decrease dependency on one specific type of source of fuel. That would be my comment. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, um, sorry, over to your game. Yeah, I just wanted to reflect on Lars when you mentioned one boiler, large boiler in a district heating. If you have one boiler and you need to change that one, then it's definitely much simpler than changing 10,000 individual boilers. And this we should always have in mind that we have an infrastructure and changing it from one state to the other is much, much simpler than if we have the individual heat generation units. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Christina, I'm going to come to you next, Anna, so be ready. Yep. So then I just return to the item on what can we do to facilitate this and uh, also returning to waste heat. So I think uh, I was thinking a lot on um, easy measures you can undertake. So, for example, we say that public sector should be energy efficient and, and all these things and uh, be forerunners in, in building energy efficiency. So why, why not make it mandatory for every official building that you erect to make uh, an assessment? What waste heat is there? What can we use from the ventilation shafts and all these things? Uh, so it comes into all the procurements that we have that would give it a big push and also to uh, acknowledge that we want to do this uh, and facilitate permitting procedures and, and things like that. that. Sounds good. And and uh, if you if you I had another thought because there's been a question come up about thermal seasonal storage and I wondered if there was something more that you could have from from your slides or from your work about about the, what's being approached or considered in in Estonia with regards to trying to store some of that summer heat um, and uh, and the opportunity and the difficulties for it maybe. You're muted, sorry. You're being a good, you're being a good member. Yeah, you're, you're still, muted. Thank still you. Master, yes, two years and still a mistake, still a muting, muting. So actually, we have studied uh, thermal energy storage uh, possibilities for, for Tallinn many times in different, from different approach and even uh, seasonal storage has been uh, evaluated too. Because we have here in Estonia such specific that uh, due to very strong support for um, renewable electricity, because uh, here feeding premiums are available. So, uh, so not only market price, but plus 53 and higher, uh, euros per megawatt hour. And these feeding premiums are working um, during 12 years and then then it is stopped and actually uh, so it is uh, um, official everything is okay yeah, that they work during all the year but reject heat to atmosphere for us for us for researchers it is just it is terrible what they're doing but uh, annual these um, uh, annual energy efficiency is okay due to flue uh, gas uh, condensers and so on. So they are working du during all the year. And uh, but uh, based on it, some thermal uh, energy storage, seasonal thermal energy storage, because usually seasonal thermal energy storage are used coupled with waste heat, regular or with the solar heat not with the CHP rejecting heat to atmosphere, yes. And uh, that is why there were some uh, studies, uh, but still it was decided that it, it is too expensive and no stability with electricity prices. So uh, this uh, project has not been implemented, but uh, uh, sorry, short-term uh, thermal energy storage, uh, they will be installed because especially during this spring and uh, uh, autumn periods when uh, it will allow to avoid uh, peak boilers switching on in September, October. It can be switched on, on much uh, later and uh, it will be enough with the CHP load. I, hope. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, it's so complicated and, and the, uh, the duration curve, as Ogib pointed out, was very interesting to see the layered um, supplies of, of heat to the overall consumption. Um, Odgir, go, go for it. Yeah, I just wanted to mention in Copenhagen, they are building a couple of large thermal storages, which is the scale would count as a seasonal storage, how we mark them today. But their intention is not to have seasonal thermal storage operation. It's more like they have heat pumps installed because of cooling of buildings, the heat cooling system. And they see a pot potential when there's a CP electricity, they just go on a full force and fill up as much of the thermal storage as they can. So they actively use it. And this is of course a great idea. Maybe I, I would like just to add, not to tell that in Tal Tallinn district heating just uh, was not was so irrational. Actually, uh, it is a project that is planned. So these waste heat during rejected heat will be used for district cooling uh, during during summer. 
period, it is a separate pro project that will be implemented. I was just looking at the chat there. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, um, Christina, go for it. I was going to. I'll come back to the chat in a sec. Yeah, I, um, I just wanted to mention also that I think it's very important that you get the main stakeholders on board, right? So for me, those are cities that need to make good decisions for the future, but it's also the green investor, which makes uh, this taxonomy coming up and all the um the jungle that it brings very important to discuss and the more i look into the taxonomy the more alar alarmed i get because uh, it's not de-risking investments it's the increasing risk to the sector so i think we have to also start um addressing that we cannot only assume that investors will want to invest in our kind of sector but also help them uh, to understand taxonomy and what we do yes i think uh, the the business case and the, and how we encourage investment in these systems. I, I, one of the questions I wanted to bring back to you guys was about we talked about different systems and 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 having like a, a range of different uh, providers of heat within a system. But I was wondering about how that might affect the overall costs of a system. You know, if you've got one biomass boiler and some waste heat providing your heat to your to your district heat system at, at cost, but then you start into introducing some some heat pumps some 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 uh, co-generation or some combined heat and power how does that affect the overall costs of the heat that you're delivering to your customers usually the more sources you have available the more stable the cost of heat becomes it might not be the cheapest one if you have too many sources of course but uh, it's also a lot about stability when it comes to a, supplying the basic needs like building heating demands and this definitely should be valid nowadays where we have had the natural gas price going through the roof yeah i think so uh, i think that's interesting christina you want to say something yes again then returning to taxonomy the more stuff you put in your network the more difficult it will be to grasp what kind of taxonomy compliance you have right so um yeah it's not easy for an outsider to come in and understand that it's more uh, spreading the risks by actually having multiple heat sources, maybe. Lars? Yeah, I, I think to have uh, different heat sources is, is a really good way. Uh, and it's also important to understand that if you will add a new heat source, it need to be cheaper. So that the role for the district heating company will be to operate the different uh, supporters, the different uh, uh, sources. So that that will be so it will be some sort of heat market that need to be operated by the the district heating company. Uh, and I will also add one thing that's important to have, I think, in a district heating network is to have a CHP uh, because then when the electricity prices are high then you on at least theoretical could reduce the district heating price. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone will do it, but I think if you look at the result for Swedish district heating company this uh, year, they have a really, really good results. Uh, and that depends on the high electricity prices. Over to you, Anna. Um, so uh, regarding regarding multiply uh, sources, uh, usually it is uh, hotel. In in the case of Estonia, again, they uh, they in this case uh, they will compete with uh, existing rather new uh, CHPs that has been installed. And another aspect is that. Uh, uh, we have very strict regulation of tariffs, of district heating tariffs, very strict methodology, and uh, it is rather uh, high bureaucratic administrative um, uh, obstacle to do something, especially if something rather small, so district heating company just to own all will have to recalculate all the district heating, uh, these tariffs and so on. No, better do as usual. No, reality. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I understand. I'm sorry, I didn't get who was next, whether it's Dimitro or uh, Odgir. Who's quickest on the button? I was quicker. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to reflect a little bit on Lars again. And 
I have totally agree. Every decision you should have a seed be planted, they're burning something. And this is the usual way. And this is also the reason why this heating prices in Denmark are going down now when the electricity and natural gas prices is going up. The utilities are simply earning more on the running the CSP plants. Dimitri? Uh, I guess uh, Oger just concluded what I wanted to say, but just a quick comment on that. I had the research project before, and then in the modeling that we applied, um, we used some projected electricity prices for the future. And uh, it might not be realistic, but the modeling showed that if electricity prices develop as they are promised to be developed, being very fluctuating, it might be the case that if a district heating company has a large CHP, they might get more money from profits from electricity sales than the cost of producing all the heat over the year. So they can get profit not only from sales of heat, but from electricity sales so much that they will cover the expenses on heat production. So they can actually deliver heat for free. I mean, this will never happen, but that's um, that was one of the results. I think that's a... Uh something that we can all hope for at least at lower, lower costs. I just want to say thanks to everyone um, for your participation and for the discussion. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, we have an opportunity to do some more, so we, we will be moving over to a, a, another another session. We have a, a team session to follow up and just to discuss some more if there's more people interested from the forerunner groups to, to participate. I want to say thanks to Pia. Thank you about the, uh, the former oil chambers. We're hoping to um, have a presenter from uh, one of the Finnish projects where they've got a large thermal store um, that they've done as a reuse of an oil chamber coming up in the Celsius Forerunner group. So that should be some interesting information on that. I like recycled heat too. And yes, you're right, waste heat, I don't think is such a good idea. We should be talking more positively about how we use energy and, and, the, uh, and the different systems that we're getting it from. Um, Yes, and I agree with Odgir that uh, material recycling, we should be looking for closed loop systems rather than the burning waste. So it's a very tricky one. And, and we didn't get into the complexities of biomass and forests and all those sorts of things, but that's for, that's for another time. So um, I wondered if anyone has any final last comments or you know anything they wanted to say about the um, where we are and how we're going to move our way towards a more positive and secure energy system. It's going to have to be a very quick one. Just my thoughts are that we cannot only look on the cost levels. We need to also look into how we can build the system for guaranteeing supply security. Yes, I think so. And Dimitri, yeah, I think you might want to come in there. Uh, a quick comment from me is that the uh, complex solutions require sophisticated tools. So if you can, please uh, stop, uh, can, don't stop, but please use also energy system modeling and planning as a tool to make your decisions. Don't just base your decisions on previous experiences. And Anna, is there anything else you'd like to bring from your perspective? I just would like to add uh, that uh, now these uh, all the district heating development, uh, not only you know, sustainability and climate aim related, but also our security uh, related. So gas reduction, uh, gas uh, consumption reduction, now it is not only a question of, uh, of uh, environmental and so on, but it is a question of policy and uh, our freedom. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's a very good way to finish. I think the, the realities of the situations in which we're in is, um, is, is almost frightening, actually, to be honest. So um, I'm hoping that all we can all take this onwards. And it's a terrible situation, but I'm hoping that we can utilize this new focus to, to lead us towards better energy systems. I think it might be time for us to all say goodbye now. So I just want to say thanks once again for everyone and um, thanks to our, to our guest experts as well to help their conversation keep progressing. For those of you that would like to join us, um, I believe that the, um, the team session has started. And if our um, presenters and uh, experts would like to join us, then we're great to see you there. So thanks everyone. Thanks very much for, for a great start to the day. Very interesting discussions and research and all the best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.